Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. And welcome to this play-by-play -play on September 1, 2022. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. And I was scheduled to be joined by my co-host, uh, Katmai National Park Ranger Kim Grossman today, but uh, there's some technical issues happening at Brooks Camp right now that she is working through. Hopefully she'll have the opportunity to join us just a little bit. So in the meantime, flying solo today. Uh, and if you hear pauses or anything like that, that's probably just me trying to gather my thoughts as I act as the color commentary, the narrator and the producer for today's broadcast. So I thank everybody for tuning in and uh, joining us today. It looks like, um, you know, another busy day on Brooks River. And we're really kind of going into the second peak season of bear watching at Brooks River in Katmai National Park. Now, I'm sure there are some of you tuning in who maybe are unfamiliar with this location or the brown bears. Uh, so let's take a quick tour, as I always like to do at the beginning of our play-by-plays. Brooks River is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska, in the west central portion of Katmai National Park one of the largest national parks in the United States at uh, about 4 million acres in size. The river itself is about a mile and a half long, bisected by Brooks Falls. It flows from left to right in this image, and the webcam signals are sent wirelessly to a couple of radio repeaters on the top of Dumpling Mountain. And then those repeaters send the signal to the park headquarters in the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away and we're grateful to be able to work with our webcam partner uh, the national park service to bring you live streaming footage of the bears at brooks river this is just a closer view of the latter half of brooks river so the lower half of brooks river and where the cameras are located brooks falls on the left hand side we'll be looking at the brooks falls camera a lot during the broadcast today the riffles camera is um, about 100 yards downstream of there and then we have a couple of options, actually three options down at the mouth of Brooks River. The Riverwatch camera basically looks upstream uh, from the north end of the bridge at the mouth of Brooks River, and its line of sight is outlined in, uh, in blue there. And then the uh, other lower river camera, uh, the one if you are finding it on explore.org is called, the lower river camera looks out towards the river mouth. Again, Brooks Falls looks mostly at uh, the waterfall itself, but it has a good view downstream a few hundred yards. And then the Riffles camera looks mostly uh, right in front of it, uh, but upstream about that hundred yard distance to Brooks Falls. From time to time, we might also go underwater as well to look at the sockeye salmon. It's a really amazing uh, view of the fish. Uh, there's uh, several questions that maybe I'll try to answer during our broadcast today. Those were submitted in advance through Ask Your Bear Cam question. So if you have um, questions for any of our live broadcasts, you can submit those in advance. Uh, you can find a link to that in the Partner tab on any of the Bear Cam pages on explore.org. Just scroll down on the left-hand side of the screen below all of the live camera feeds. And we're actually soliciting questions right now for a special live event coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's an interview with Katmai National Park uh, Superintendent Mark Sturm. And last I checked, there weren't many questions for uh, the superintendent uh, in our spreadsheet. So if you want to ask questions of the park superintendent and want to pick his brain, please submit those questions there. Now, uh, going back up to live footage of uh, Brooks Falls and bears there, we are looking at four large adult males. Some are bigger than others, of course, just based on body size, but these are all really big dudes. Um, in the foreground, sitting there like he often tends to do, uh, kind of on the left-hand side of the screen, that is the giant known as 747. And he doesn't typically fish like that. I think he just likes to sit there uh, and, and rest uh, from time to time. He, he sat in that position, I think, really since early adulthood. I have some pictures of him, you know, coming, uh, going way back to like 2007 and 2008. 
basically doing that 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 same sit in that position. So bears definitely are creatures of habit. And the one that the bear that's immediately behind 747 is number 801. He's an adult male. Um, we don't know much about his early life. He was, I think, if I remember correctly, identified in 2018. The bear behind 801 there, a little bit blonder in appearance, a little lighter brown, definitely blonder ears uh, with a light shoulder patch there in his right shoulder. That is the venerable and world famous 480 Otis. He's one of the older adult males that we have at Brooks River. But uh, on the right-hand side of the screen is also another older adult male bear. And that is a bear that we haven't seen at the river in at least a month, if not coming up on six weeks or seven weeks or so. Uh, that is uh, number 634, Popeye. And he just returned to the river maybe a, uh, a half hour ago, I think. At least I don't recall seeing him on the cameras or seeing people talking about him in the comments uh, until you know, just a, just a few minutes ago. So, so he's uh, another large uh, adult male, and he is not a young guy either. Um, he's in his mid-20s, um, maybe not as old as Otis, but not that much younger either. Uh, Popeye was first identified as a, let me check my notes here, yeah, as an older sub-adult bear in 2002. So that means he was right around, you know, four or five years old at that time. Otis was identified as an adult bear in 2001, a young adult. So I think Popeye and Otis are probably only separated by a few um, years time at most. However, Popeye uh, is much more dominant than Otis. Um, prior to Popeye showing up uh, on the far wall there, Otis was fishing in that spot, but Otis did not want to, um, to tangle with Popeye. So he decided to, <laughs> he's kind of stuck between a few large bears there, I think um, weighing his weighing his, uh, um, his odds and his next move. Um, so going from very large bears right now to very old bears, or excuse me, very large bears and old bears to um, very young bears at the beginning of their life. Um, this is uh, number 910's spring cub. So this is a first year cub folks, uh, cub folks, very cute. And also a bear that uh, has shown a bit of perseverance this summer. We saw it limping not that long ago. Uh, and it looked, the injury kind of looked uh, a little bit severe, but it seems to, uh, this bear seems to have healed quite well from that. So let me, uh, I think I have a clip of that we can pull up real quick. We don't really see any evidence. Let me restart this for you of this um, spring cub, you know, showing signs of like uh, that it's that it's injured or hobbled on that right front foot, like you're going to see in this um, image. This was or this video. This was from the 22nd of August. So not that long ago, I uh, definitely uh, didn't want to place weight on the bottom of its front foot or maybe it, it had, you know, a toe injury or a, an injury to its paw pad. We don't really know, uh, but the cub quickly healed. Uh, this is actually the next day. We can see it walking on that paw, almost like normal, but a little bit of a limp there. And now we're not really seeing um, any indication that that she's injured. So even young bears are very resilient. Uh, they heal from injuries quite quickly. They're very tough animals. They have a high tolerance for pain. At least it seems that way. Uh, I think maybe the most famous example that I can think of that I have experienced at the river, as far as we're talking about cub, is um, a bear who was nicknamed Tundra. And as a yearling in 2008, it looked like she had, uh, she had a really gnarly wound above one of her eyes. Um, and I thought it was just a flesh wound. She ended up dying a few years later. Um, to make a long story short, however, um, rangers, one of the rangers uh, collected the skull uh, we ended up cleaning it and keeping it uh, for educational purposes. Um, and when we looked at the skull, it found out uh, that Tundra didn't just have a flesh wound as a yearling. She had a, a, a skull fracture um, that was partly, uh, or you know, it, it healed as best as it could uh, by the time that she happened to die. And uh, her death probably was the result of another bear, probably wasn't related to the skull fracture, uh, but nobody happened to witness that. So again, uh, bear cubs are extremely tough. You know, we, we marvel at the toughness of, of adults, but, you know, cubs can really 
um, take a lot uh, if they are forced to, of course. Now, where is mom in this image? I think mom is, right now is standing on the rock at extreme upper right. So I think that's number 910 uh, right now, um, waiting maybe for a, a turn to fish the jacuzzi or again, just weighing her options. We have seen uh, number 910 and her sister, number 909, fishing the falls a lot, sometimes together, sometimes apart. Um, and it's really been really fun to watch those families interact. And I, I definitely want to take some time a little bit later in our broadcast to talk more specifically about that, because there's been some cool stuff going on between those, um, those bear families uh, this week. Looks like number 910 right now moving off of that rock maybe going to the lip of the falls she loves to fish uh the lip it's at the waterfall at least it seems to be her preferred um, fishing location i mentioned before how bears are creatures of habit and they'll go back to the same places to fish over and over again looking back on the far side of of brooks falls number 634 popeye on that far wall he likes to fish against the far wall. We'll occasionally see him in the middle of the waterfall, especially early in the salmon run, fishing there. Uh, more rarely, maybe in the jacuzzi. Uh, he'll try the lip of, of Brooks Falls. But definitely in this season, we frequently see uh, Popeye against the far wall of, of Brooks Falls. So... You know, they don't forget once they, you know, figure out a strategy that works for them, they're likely to continue to try that again and again and, and again. So as you're trying to identify bears, one of the things that you can uh, do at first is, you know, learn about some of their physical features, of course. And I, I say this a lot during our broadcast, but also try to uh, take notes of their behaviors. You can start by identifying some of the easier bears to ID, like Otis, for example. Again, he's the lighter a blonde bear with that shoulder patch who's kind of standing um, back turned towards the waterfall at, at center. Um, he's a fairly recognizable brown bear. Popeye, to me, really is a an arc, archetype brown bear. He has all of those classic brown bear features. He has um, a prominent shoulder hump, which you don't find in black bears. You don't find that really in polar bears. He has a rounded sort of dinner plate shaped face, very round, a blocky muzzle, um, grizzled fur, very thick fur. And, um, you know, he's a handsome guy for a brown bear. Doesn't really have a lot of scars. And this is him uh, in early summer, just a couple of years ago to give you an idea of what he looks like um, at that time of the year. So you can really end up differentiating based on their, uh, their physical features and their behavioral characteristics. Number 910 right now on the lip of Brooks Falls. She is a skilled angler there. Her mother took her to that location or at least um, visited the falls with her when she was younger. And 910 is not that old. She was born in 2016. So that spring cub that's still hanging out um, near the falls but not venturing out onto the waterfall with mom um, is her represents her first known litter, at least um, the only litter that we know of. There, we haven't seen evidence of her uh, with cubs before um, before this year. Sometimes we can tell, sometimes we can't. Like if a mother bear or a female bear shows up at the river without cubs, sometimes it looks like they might have been lactating and nursing a cub. Uh, and while we don't know with 100% certainty whether, uh, you know, that, that bear truly did have a litter and somehow lost it, on the way to Brooks River for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's a pretty good indication, but we hadn't seen any evidence of that, at least that I can remember with number 910. In the jacuzzi, a bear, I think that maybe just showed up um, recently, although we see him in early summer as well. That might be uh, number 907. And he's also a bear that was introduced to Brooks River by his mother. And we don't know specifically, uh, or with 100% certainty who the mothers of a, a lot of these bears are. You know, the only really way to confirm that with certainty is DNA evidence. But, but in a lot of cases, you know, the younger bears, when they're yearlings or two and a half year old cubs, they start to develop physical characteristics that allow 
them to sort of stand apart from the crowd. And if you watch carefully, then you can see them um, the next year as an independent bear return to the river and be like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I think that's probably 708, some, 708 Amelia's, uh, one of her cubs from a few years ago. So 907, I think, in the jacuzzi right now. And he's a young adult male at this moment. He's, um, you know, not nearly as big as the bears on the far side of Brooks Falls. So if one of those bears came over in his um, direction, he would likely yield that fishing spot. Great catch there by number 910 on the lip of the falls. And it looks like her cub um, recognized that as well. And they both happened to part to depart fairly quickly. So neither one of them in sight right now. I'm just going off camera to enjoy their catch. I want to go downstream uh, to some of the cameras at the mouth of Brooks River just a moment here, but there was a uh, question that came in in advance that is, uh, I think, pertinent to um, some of the conversations we've been having during the broadcast today so far. And that uh, question is, I noticed that the dominant adult male bears like 856, 747, 480 all seem to be in or want access to the far pool and not the jacuzzi, which is usually their coveted spot. Any hypotheses about why this is so? You know, early, as we look at 907 here in the jacuzzi, earlier in the year, you would have found 747 there frequently, almost all the time. Occasionally, you know, he will go and fish over on the far side during the beginning of the salmon run, but he really loves to fish in the jacuzzi. Uh, Otis will do that too. A56 will do that as well. But yeah, we have been seeing a lot of those really big bears hanging out on the far side. And I think that's because they recognize right now that the salmon migration period is pretty much done. And at, at Brooks River, you have this wave of salmon arriving in late June and July as salmon push upstream uh, to, uh, to spawning grounds in the upper river area or um, in tributaries of Lake Brooks, or maybe spawning on some of the beaches of Lake Brooks, the submerged beaches. But once that migration period is over, Brooks Falls, you know, tends to not always be the best place to fish. Uh, so, you know, the jacuzzi doesn't have a lot of salmon swirling in it like it did earlier in the summer. However, there are still uh, fish that are moving underwater right now near the vicinity of the falls looking for the right place to spawn. There could be some uh, coho salmon that are arriving at this time of the year um, that bears are fishing for. Uh, so they could, they could find those salmon um, in the jacuzzi or on the lip of the falls. In fact, I think if you see a, a salmon jump the falls successfully at this time of the year, it is probably a coho salmon rather than a sockeye salmon. And in, on the far side, I think maybe the bears, um, you know, those big bears that we were looking at before just have recognized that there's a higher likelihood of success um, if, they, if they're standing in that shallow water on the far side because there's just not as many salmon migrating through. There's salmon just looking for the right place to spawn. Not sure if I have an, a picture of a coho salmon uh, available, but a great look, live look at sockeye salmon from the underwater camera. This is attached to um, the floating, or excuse me, the uh, elevated bridge across Brooks River. Most of the way across from this view on our lower river camera, but pointing downstream. I guess uh, uh, some people say that's a face that only a mother salmon could love, but <laughs> I do think the sockeye are beautiful animals uh, overall. And uh, these fish are staging. They're waiting for the right time to go up river to spawn. Uh, some, a lot of spawning is happening right now, uh, downstream of Brooks Falls in, in the Riffles area. This is a fantastic spot for salmon to fish. And I think a Riffles camera actually today might be powered down. So this is just a still frame from right before uh, that happened, uh, just to save power for the falls um, system. But yeah, these fish are looking for, um, you know, the right time to spawn. These fish are unlikely to try to jump Brooks Falls. They were probably spawned downstream of Brooks River, or excuse me, of Brooks Falls. So they don't have a need to go upstream of the falls itself. Um, their genes are telling them, you know, about when the right time of the year to spawn is. But right now they're testing, waiting for the right water temperature itself. 
water temperature has a huge influence on the incubation period of the eggs. So the salmon are waiting for, a lot of these fish are waiting for the water temperature to cool down just a little bit further before they go upstream and try to spawn themselves. You can recognize sockeye salmon by this, uh, that bright green head and red backs at this time of the year. When the sun is shining down, it's an overcast day at Brooks River right now, but when the sun is shining brightly down through the water, the backs of the fish really glow. It's just a bright, bright red, a really beautiful uh, sight to behold. And it's remarkable how many salmon this ecosystem supports. Naknek Lake, for example, going to our lower river camera here, Naknek Lake off in the distance where Brooks River empties into. This year, about 2 million salmon, sockeye salmon, swim up into Brooks, or excuse me, into Naknek uh, Lake. Uh, uh, perhaps 20% of those go up Brooks River. We don't really know that for sure, but on average, you know, that's our best, um, best info that we have on that right now. And I think I read recently, and I can't remember the statistic, the exact statistic, but that's far more sockeye salmon than all of the salmon that or all of the sockeye salmon that swam into the Columbia River uh, between Oregon and Washington this year. And the Columbia River watershed, if you're familiar with that watershed, is much, much bigger than the Naknek River watershed overall. So this is an extremely rich landscape for salmon. Uh, a tremendous diversity of aquatic habitats from slow moving portions of river to swift streams to small spring fed streams and snowmelt fed streams to places where they can spawn underwater on submerged beaches and deep water lakes if they experience a heat wave they can they can tuck themselves down in the deep water of the lakes and stay cool waiting for the for the temp the water temperatures to to be more conducive to their metabolism. And that's much, much different than what you find in the contiguous United States where most watersheds are heavily engineered by people and altered by people. We don't have that in Bristol Bay um, and the Katmai region. And I think we should fight to keep it that way. Going back up to our falls low camera right now, this is uh, located uh, on one of the pilings for the Brooks Falls wildlife viewing camera. So it's, it's not quite be right below the Brooks Falls camera. This is the Brooks Falls camera again, but fairly close to it. So it give you a different perspective on the waterfall itself. So it looks like maybe now a couple of smaller, younger adult males sitting on the far side of Brooks Falls Right now, we're not seeing a whole lot of activity from a lot of the bears that are using <laughs> uh, Brooks Falls. The, overall, you know, sometimes we don't see them catching a lot of salmon uh, at the waterfall at this time of the year, but they are very well fed. And I, I think you can see that obviously when they get out of the water, especially, and you can see how much fat that they have on their bodies. Many of the bears, if not most of the bears that we see at Brooks River right now are, are just as fat as any bear that you're gonna find in the lower 48 states in October. In, even though these bears have uh, another month uh, to six weeks to fish for uh, salmon and continue to gain weight before winter hibernation. And that's what they're working towards. Their survival is dependent on their ability to gain enough body fat to survive winter hibernation. And, and winter comes quick in Katmai. Uh, the salmon run uh, for sockeye in Brooks River really starts to peter out quickly at the uh, beginning of October, we'll see a lot of bears start to disperse away from Brooks River at that time, but we'll sometimes see bears using Brooks River into uh, into November. Uh, so there's still good, could be a lot of bear watching uh, to do over the next couple of months. If you're new to bear cam, it's um, it's a long season. So um, we're, we're grateful that you were able to uh, join the last couple of months of it. Right now, a view of number 910 again on the lip of Brooks Falls with another catch. Their second of the broadcast today. 
Her spring cub on the left hand side, they're just uh, relaxing from time to time. Sometimes people are wonder, often wonder, you know, why doesn't the cub go out and, and get fish from mom? And they certainly will when they're feeling comfortable enough and they're hungry enough. I think hunger might drive them to, to do that more than their comfort level around other bears. But uh, 910 spring cub is pretty big uh, and obviously well fed, very fat. That's not, <laughs> there's, there's a, a lot of fur going on there that helps to make the cub look, look big, but there's also a lot of body fat there. Um, compared to adult bears, spring cubs are small, but um, you know, compared to like your average dog, they're, they're fairly large. Um, you know, again, this, this cub was born late January, early February. So really it's only eight months old. And uh, right now it may weigh uh, 60 to 70 pounds. And when it was born, it was only one pound. So they undergo a tremendous amount of growth in their first year. People do wonder whether, you know, this cub will be nursing in the den. It'll be suckling milk in the den and that it won't be this winter. So only newborn cubs suckle milk in the den. After that, they're going into, into hibernation like mom and they're gonna need to uh, survive on their fat reserves. I'm not sure what spooked them. Can't see anything on the Falls Low camera either, but uh, something happened that uh, I think maybe another bear was uh, a little too close. And maybe it was um, the arrival of 747 in the jacuzzi there. They just did not want to be close enough to him, even if he had not uh, shown aggression towards them. I don't think our camera caught any aggression towards the family. But sometimes just the approach of a large adult male is enough to get the attention of a smaller bear or a bear family. And they'll say, you know what? We just don't want to be around this big guy. We're not comfortable with it. And hence um, their departure from uh, the lip of the falls. On the far side, uh, it looks like 801 has taken the position where 747 was before. And 480 Otis is kind of still stuck in the middle there trying to fish. He, he will fish successfully in that spot on the that middle spot of the far pool. I don't think that's his preferred spot. We just don't see him going there unless he's forced to. So I think Popeye is still on the far wall. And when you see these bears interacting with one another, there are a lot of examples of, uh, of domino effects, uh, cascading effects of one bear moving to one place and that displaces one another bear who displaces another bear. So you see, um, you know, the dominoes fall as one bear moves throughout the river. And if 747, who's again in the jacuzzi, would move to uh, the far side, we would we would definitely see those bears shuffling again. And if you're just joining me today, thanks for tuning in to this play-by-play -play broadcast. We're looking at live footage of bears fishing for salmon at world-famous Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. I used to be a park ranger at Brooks River for uh, several years, uh, and I miss being there but I'm grateful for the opportunity to continue to share you know, this experience with everybody. This is one of the best places in the world to watch brown bears. 747 now done with the jacuzzi, moving over to the far side of Brooks River. It looks like that might've been a young male, number 164, I think, um, who is just getting out of the way. And that's, <laughs> that's how most of these interactions between adult bears um, play out. The subordinate bear, the smaller bear, just gives way to the approach of the more dominant bear. Brown bears at Brooks Falls and, and across really everywhere they go, they live in a hierarchy, although they interact most frequently in places where there are high concentrations of food, um, like, like Brooks River. And uh, the bigger the bear, generally the more dominant you are. This position plays a big role. So if you are more aggressive and you're a good fighter, then you can rank higher uh, in the hierarchy and punch above your weight so to speak. 747, he is not as um, assertive as other bears, but he knows he's so big that other bears are unlikely to challenge him. So he'll kind of do what he wants. 
most often at the river. And that does work out for him a lot. And we should watch what happens with the bears uh, on the far side of the waterfall as he approaches. They might just kind of sit there because all of these bears are very familiar with one another. They don't need to really sort out the hierarchy again. 747 isn't necessarily in this moment looking to displace number 801 or number 480 Otis who have their backs against the wall. 747 doesn't really fish that uh, that spot against the walk wall where Popeye is sitting either. Uh, so I think his presence is just going to make Otis and 801 a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but it doesn't look like uh, 747 wants to push them out of that that spot, at least at the moment. A little yawn there by 801. Um, not quite comfortable. But you can see how 747, with that giant belly of his, almost dragging on the ground, sitting down with his back facing away from 801. He is not at all concerned by the close proximity of 801 or 480 Otis. Uh, Otis opening his mouth there a little bit. Um, I don't think that's a yawn. I think he's kind of growling. When another bear crowds a space, he bellows. It's a very deep bellow. Um, that's one of the ways that I always know Otis is around at the river because he does bellow uh, quite a bit in these, um, in these interactions. Our falls, uh, our microphone isn't sensitive enough to pick that up over the sound of uh, the waterfall, I don't believe. I can try to bump that up, that audio up, and see, but I don't know if we'll be able to hear it. No, it doesn't sound like that, but that we can hear it. Oh, it's definitely, you know, it is opening some alpha like that. Uh, when they yawn, they're they're quiet when they yawn, just like us. Um, yawning is a sign of uh, stress in the bear. can be uh, a sign that you're just tired, but when you see them, you know, in this context, interacting, they're close to other bears, then it's certainly an indication that um, of, of stress rather than awakeness. 801, not concerned with uh, the first proximity of Otis either, so fishing right um, right next to him. Uh, this audio back down here. So three really big guys. Um, they all could be in Fat Bear Week as well, and that's coming up. <laughs> At the, uh, pretty soon, Fapper Jr. is uh, September 29 and 30 this year, where you get to vote for who you think is the chubbiest cub of the year. And then the winner of that gets thrown into the larger Fapper Week bracket, which begins on October 5. And you can find more inform information about Fapper Week and just what the heck that is uh, on fapperweek.org. Our partners for that are Katmai National Park and the Katmai Conservancy. Getting a little closer now to um, our side of the river where our cameras are located, a couple of young males engaging in a little bit of a, a play interaction um, right before I cut over. So maybe number 907 again, moving into the jacuzzi. Uh, not 100% sure on that. But uh, again, these bears are very familiar with one another. And I think that works to their advantage. Um, you know, when you know and you remember who your competitors are in the river, who are your friends, then it's much, much easier to kind of make a living. You know who to avoid, and then you know which bears you can kind of um, saddle up next to and, um, you know, kind of take advantage of the extra space that that bear will, will provide or at least tolerate <laughs> you taking space away from it. Speaking of familiarity and the advantage of the advantages of a social um, life. I think I want to take a few minutes now to talk about uh, a bear family that we've been seeing on the river or families that have shown us, I think, a great amount of, uh, or that have shown, yeah, a great amount of tolerance for each other, familiarity. And I want to kind of talk about how that might be advantageous um, 
for them. So this is um, footage here from our lower river camera just two days ago. So this is from the 30th of August. We have two bear families in this vicinity here. Uh, number 909 in her yearling and number 910 in her spring cub. I think this is 910 in the spring cub in the foreground, 909 and oh, okay, here it comes. That was the, <laughs> getting all confused here because these families have kind of been mixed up. Um, the spring cub just coming into view there. So on the right-hand side, the two bears uh, that are smaller, those are the cubs. So the spring cub and the yearling right now beginning to play. Um, so these are cubs from two different families and the mother bears um, are just completely relaxed and okay with this. Uh, and we don't often see that. Um, number 909 and number 910 are sisters. They uh, were born uh, to Beadnose, number 409, who we unfortunately no longer see at Brooks River. This is Beadnose from July 11th, 2018, with a big belly. So right after she separated from her cubs, I think she won Fat Bear Week that year. You can tell why <laughs> this is early summer and you can see how fat uh, she was. Now, so uh, she had two cubs. She weaned them successfully. They lived as, um, you know, subadult bears for a number of years along Brooks River. They associated with one another a lot. But last year, number 909 came back with a spring cub and she has returned or with two spring cubs. But this year she just has one yearling. She uh, lost one of those other cubs, I think, fairly early on uh, last year. Uh, but at that uh, last year, we didn't really see her interacting with um, her sister, number 910. And I think that was because number 910 was single. Um, seems like the um, maybe the social interactions that her cub wants maybe has precipitated um, some of the more playful um, interactions that we've seen between these two families. So this is number 910 right now, kind of sitting on her behind, swaying her head in, the, head in the air very in a very playful manner, playing with her sister now, the other mother bear with the blonder ears on the far side. Their cubs all playing. This is just one big pile of playing bears. And I don't think I've ever seen two mother bears playing like this. And we've seen this several times. This isn't the first instance. This is, I think, one of the better clips that we have um, and, and great looks at or a great look at it. But yeah, this is this has been quite remarkable to see, and I want to you know emphasize that this is this is pretty rare, in places where you do have high concentrations of bears fishing for salmon, like Brooks River. We don't really see this. Uh, I, at least I can't remember an instance of seeing something like this. There are a couple of, I think factors that influence sort of like the tolerance that they these bears have all for one another. Of course, one of them is their family relations, uh, 909 and 910 being sisters, remember each other. So they know, hey, you know, oh yeah, you were cool when we were younger. So, um, you know, we can hang out together. Uh, that definitely plays a role. The, the fact that they're well-fed plays a very big role as well. If the salmon run had tanked this year and there weren't a lot of fish, at the river and the bears had to compete a lot harder for food and were hungrier, we probably wouldn't see such a relaxed nature even between uh, related individuals. Certainly not mother bears because mother bears have to work harder than any other bear to keep themselves fed and to keep their cubs fed. And then of course, uh, I think the last thing is uh, just the, the, the mere fact that um, these uh, mother bears are young as bears age especially when they get into their late teens uh they're not as playful as they were when they were younger so both of these mother bears with uh their first litters and again 910 and 909 were born in 2016 so not that old young moms and i guess one one other factor that influences their overall uh, playfulness happens to be the the similarity in age of their cubs. This is less likely to happen if the um, the cubs were separated by a couple of years. So let's say um, if one of the one of the moms had uh, a two and a half year old this year and one of the moms had 
a first year cub. Uh, they're, the size difference probably would just be a little bit too much. We, I don't think we would see them playing with one another, but I've been uh, proven wrong before. <laughs> so, so we'll see, you know, what happens in, uh, in coming years. We don't know if number 909 is going to separate from her cub next year. She could. That's what her mother had done uh, historically, but she might keep it for um, another year. We definitely uh, know as long as the cub survives that um, 910's cub will be with her next year. As a, again, another example of how rare this is, um, I'll cut to a couple of still images. Uh, this is um, number 408 in 2007. 408 is, the, is thought to be the mother of number 128 Grazer, who we see on the river a lot this year. 408 is sister to number 409 Bead Nose. And I don't remember in 2007 when they both had cubs in the river, them, those bears really interacting. Uh, I could have missed it. I wasn't as, um, as good of an observer of bear behavior at that time. So it's, it's quite possible I missed it, but I don't think so. Um, 408 had two and a half year old cubs, three big two and a half year old cubs that would play with each other a lot that year. And number 409 had two spring cubs, or three spring cubs originally. She um, ended up weaning just uh, the two of them, I think, from that litter. So again, I think maybe the age difference had something to do with it. Also, just the different dispositions. But they were not um, older bears uh, in 2007, though, um, 408 and 409. So looking back through family history, you can't really say, at least from what I was able to see during that year, that... Uh, you know that there's a there's a family history of this this type of interaction going on so i think we just have two unique bear families coming together at the right place at the right time so we can enjoy um you know the the bit of joy that they are experiencing when cubs play with one with one another i have no doubt that they're, in some way they are experiencing fun and joy just like we do um, when we are playing a game uh, with our friends the tolerance for one another extends beyond play with these families. Um, cutting to another clip here from um, last week. Um, this is, let's see, number 910 in her spring cub, so, um, and uh, 909's yearling. So the yearling on the right, spring cub on the left, 910 in the middle. And you can see there uh, that the yearling took fish away from 910, and 910 let her do it. You would not see that happening, I think, under, you know, sort of normal circumstances. You would not, first of all, have seen a, uh, a yearling, strange yearling approaching um, a, a strange mother bear. And you would not have seen that mother bear tolerate um, the yearling's approach to take fish away from her spring cub under most circumstances. So that is, you know, kind of, I think, another example of how, just how rare uh, and special, you know, the, these things that we've been seeing uh, between these families are. So really quite wonderful. Um, this clip too, um, you can maybe see a little bit of um, something white sticking out of the yearling's uh, top of the nose. And those are porcupine quills. Uh, cut to a different clip here. Uh, the yearling in this clip actually catches a salmon on the lip of the falls, but you can get a look at um, a couple of those quills in in the muzzle of of, of the yearling. Uh, these days, though, um, more recently, I haven't been able to see any quills in the muzzle of the yearling. So um, they either work their way out, or maybe they broke off. Maybe there's still some remnants inside, but um, she seems to be. Uh, or the yearling seems to be no worse for wear. And the, just as an example, this is from the 28th of October. This is the yearling again. Can't see any of the quills in there. So, um, so there could still be, you know, some quills in her muzzle that we can't see but there doesn't seem to be, at least be any visual or behavioral evidence that suggests that she is suffering from that injury still.
Let's go back to live footage right now of of Brooks Falls. Again, when you're looking at 909 and 910, you know you, we witness those um, moments of joy and survival and, and family and the hunger, uh, the tolerance and the friendship between them. And we get to see some of those things between uh, young adult males who are familiar with one another, who are friendly with one another. I don't think it's a stretch to say that bears have friends because we will see sometimes bears seeking out the company of certain bears. They will say, hey, you know, I remember you. Let's have a play fight. They don't do that with all bears. They just don't approach other bears randomly. Uh, so I, I, I definitely think that bears uh, have the intelligence and the awareness to remember who's who in their environment. And that is a great advantage to their survival, especially when you're trying to um, sort your place into the hierarchy. Or if you just want a, a good old fashioned wrestling match. Otis is one of those bears that we don't see <laughs> play fighting very often. Although I, uh, I think in a uh, past couple of years, we may have seen some instances of him jawing with another bear. As the spring cub, um, nine, 10 spring cub moves a little bit deeper into the water there. Younger bears aren't nearly as patient uh, anglers as older bears. They can be sometimes, but I don't think any bear really matches the patience of Otis. He will sit, he will stand almost motionless for minutes and minutes on end. Sometimes even at the point where it looks like he's falling asleep in the river, and I think sometimes he might. But if a salmon, a salmon were to swim up against his paws right now, we would see him jump into action uh, with extremely quick reflexes. So he is, um, you know, even though he's an old bear, it doesn't seem like he's lost any of that, that, um, that reflex quickness. I don't think he can run nearly as fast as he used to. He certainly can't run as fast as a younger bear. And that's not just because of his weight. I think that's probably maybe uh, also because of his age, although I wouldn't try to outrun him. I still think he could <laughs> easily outrun me. But his reflexes, don't seem to be impacted by his age at all. At least not yet. Um, and again, he's a bear who's in his uh, mid 20s. And again, these bears are looking for salmon that um, are spawning in the vicinity of Brooks Falls or migrating upstream to Brooks Falls, looking to take advantage of the fish, take advantage of the topography of the river to catch fish. And one of the questions that did come in advance happens to do with salmon. And let me bring that up. I think as I edited it, I might have edited it wrong. So it might, <laughs> might I think I accidentally removed the noun, but it's, there's, it's supposed to say, what route do salmon swim to Brooks River? So uh, let me bring up a quick map here to show everybody that route itself. Uh, the white line, represents the route salmon swim to get to Brooks River. So on the left-hand side, that is the uh, very eastern portion of Bristol Bay, more specifically, that's called Quechac Bay. Uh, and salmon enter Brooks River from there. They, they come from the North Pacific and then through the Bering Sea, swimming thousands of miles in the open ocean for two to three years before they return to fresh water. And as they swim through Brooks River, that squiggly line sort of on the left, uh, side of the line, uh, or excuse me, through Naknek River. That's about 30 miles until they get to Naknek Lake. And then they have to cross Naknek Lake, and that is uh, another 30 miles. So these fish uh, swim at least 60 miles of fresh water to get to Brooks River. They didn't climb a whole lot of elevation. I think, um, you know, the mouth of the river is maybe only about, oh, 30 to maybe just, yeah, maybe as 
low as, as 30 feet in elevation. If I could be getting that wrong, it could be as high as 60. I apologize for not looking up that statistic ahead of time. But these are fish, again, that are waiting to spawn um, upstream, like I mentioned before. Spawning activity looks quite a bit different than the salmon just kind of hanging out on the lower river camera. This is a clip from the park movie, The Ends of the Earth. This is from the, this is recorded um, right below the Riffles platform. So um, you'll see female salmon fan the gravel with her tail. You'll see male salmon competing with one another for access to the females. This is footage that I recorded at uh, the upper end of Brooks River near Lake Brooks. But in the river itself, a couple of males um, displaying to one another, um, trying to dissuade the other from maybe getting close to a female that they're looking um, to fertilize the eggs of. And one thing that I really love about this clip is you can see how the topography of the river bottom is just all of these, these um, pillows and craters. And that's from the female salmon digging their nest. And it's, it's always remarkable for me to consider just how much work that takes. Not only the amount of work it takes to migrate upstream to this point, doing it all without eating, mind you. They don't eat once they return to fresh water. But also, you know, digging their nests with their tails. They don't have hands. They don't have shovels. So they are essentially beating their bodies uh, and wearing their bodies down to dig their nests under um, under the water. So the, the fish themselves, you know, we talk about the toughness of the bears, but the fish themselves are just remarkable uh, creatures. And they are the... Um, the keystone of this ecosystem. You can't overstate the importance of sockeye salmon to the Bristol Bay and the Katmai region. So as we enjoy the bears on the bear cam, almost every time you see a bear catching a fish, you know, again, think about that fish's plight, how far it went only to not succeed, but um, it's there as part of, you know, uh, it's, it's still playing a role enriching the ecosystem itself and allowing you know Katmai National Park to support more than 2,000 brown bears that last estimate. Some of the highest bear densities anywhere in the world can be found in Katmai National Park and we would not have that without the salmon. Our Brooks Falls camera right now looking downstream towards the riffles The water fairly shallow in the riffles, but salmon have a lot of escape routes in that area. So we don't really see bears uh, fishing there uh, too much unless the salmon densities are really high, especially early in uh, the salmon run. If we get a big you know, wave of fish moving through the river, you can sometimes see that, um, the, the water rippling with the fish and the bears recognize that and they'll chase the salmon through that area. Or sometimes they'll sit in a few, uh, or near some of the boulders where they know uh, salmon might have a hard time spotting them and they will they will take advantage of that opportunity but more often if a bear is going to sit and wait for salmon to come to it it's going to be at brooks falls where the topography is a bit more conducive to bears catching uh, salmon although we haven't seen too much of that um during the broadcast i think maybe the only bear we've seen catching a salmon uh, hasn't been scavenged at least has been uh, number 910 the mother bear with her spring cub so good for her it's not like uh, you know 747 or Otis or 801 or Popeye or any of these bears that we're seeing right now are really hurting for fish uh, 747 in fact when he walks up the hill on the far side it really looks like <laughs> he's a rough go at it just because his belly is so big and the very large bears overheat very quickly as well just because they're just so massive they they have a, a lot of volume to their bodies, but not a lot of surface area to cool off. So I think for them, even at this time of the year where the air temperatures can be in the 40s, it can be raining all the time, and the water temperatures can be very cold, uh, they are quite comfortable in the water. They seem to be uh, have a high tolerance for cold water. And I think um, you know one of the reasons for that is that you know right now their digestive tract is just one big fermentation tank full of salmon.
With um, just a few minutes left in our broadcast here, let's uh, head downriver to the Riverwatch camera. So this is located near the mouth of Brooks River, looking upstream. A bear snorkeling through the river, looking for salmon that can't swim away. So this is a typical example of the behavior of, that you'll see of bears in the lower river vicinity. Although you'll see a bunch of different stuff, you'll see them diving from time to time. Um, but you know, most often they don't like to get their ears wet. So they're just moving very slowly, not expending energy unnecessarily when they're fishing, at least. They're just being extremely efficient. All of the bears are masters of energy economics. They know how to run the math in their brains intuitively. They're experiencing uh, you know, too much hunger. They're not going to be uh, playing a lot. If, uh, if things are good, though, and, and they're, they're catching a lot of fish, maybe they'll have a little bit of extra energy, even late into summer, to play with one, one another. Or just go on a walkabout or you know, explore the landscape. A lot of space available, available for bears in the lower half of Brooks River to snorkel and look for dead salmon. So we don't see as much aggressive interactions between bears in the lower river, especially at this time of the year. They tend to um, avoid each other more often than not. And starting to get a little breezy on the river right now, but it doesn't look too windy out towards the lake itself. So this area of Nacknack Lake probably just uh, protected from the prevailing winds, at least today. You might be able to discern just a little bit of uh, color difference in the water itself out towards the lake it has more of a uh, a lighter blue look rather than sort of like the pewter or gray look of the river water itself so the lake water has a lot of glacial flour in it that's just pulverized rock that is um, suspended in the water itself of Naknek lake from a different river and it is as fine as flour really when you look at it on a uh, under a microscope and measure the particle size, it is just as fine as the white bread flour you can buy at a grocery store. So it doesn't set out, out of the water column very uh, quickly, and it can remain suspended there for months um, at a time. And it sort of scatters uh, blue uh, and green light almost in the same manner that uh, the elements in our atmosphere uh, scattered blue light and that's why you know our sky is that wonderful blue so look for increasing bear activity in the lower half of brooks river during the rest of the the month um, this is again the second peak season of bear activity at brooks river we're going to see more and more bears showing up at the river uh, for the next several weeks and really like the peak number of bears in late summer and, er and early fall tends to be around uh, the very end of September and early October. So uh, I think we can expect to see a lot of bears coming back to the river that we haven't seen in a few weeks, at least since early summer, and some bears we probably haven't seen uh, all summer who have been surviving elsewhere in the, uh, in the area. But survival is the name of the game for these bears. They definitely can't take the time to play, as we saw with 910 in some of those clips, playing with her sister and her yearling. And then also, uh, you know, we see them practicing their craft. We get to give thanks, you know, to the salmon and what they provide to this ecosystem and remind ourselves to double our efforts to protect uh, this wonderful landscape. I'm glad everybody uh, took time out of their day to join me during this play-by-play -play broadcast. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. That was a lot of talking for me over the last hour, so I'm going to take a break. But you don't have to take a break from the bears. So if you are want to watch more bears, just head over to explore.org right now, explore.org slash bears, or just type in bear cam 
or Brooks Falls Cam into a search engine and you can find the Brooks Falls Cam almost immediately. Remember to um, submit your questions in advance for any of our live broadcasts, but particularly the uh, live chat with Superintendent Mark Sturm. And we're also uh, soliciting questions for um, Fat Bear Week in the Classroom, which is a special broadcast for teachers and their students. If you want to incorporate Fat Bear Week into your classroom, you can find more information about that from the moderators in the chats, or also look at the featured comments um, on the Bear Camp pages on explore.org for links and more info. Again, thanks for joining me today. My name is Mike Pitts with explore.org. And until we talk again, Enjoy the best.